I'd like to talk about a problem that I think is going to be the focus of tomorrow's symposium, too, if I understand it correctly. Basically, very large scale collective problem solving. And I want to do that in the context of what you might think of as a case study of a specific attempt we've done to facilitate very large scale collective problem solving, that is the Climate Collab. Uh, this is a project that has occurred over, actually over the last 10 years, it's been public for the last um, six years, I believe. Uh, a number of people over that time have played critical roles in doing all this, including Gary Olson, whose name you see there, and a couple of other people in the room, including Jim Herxleb. Uh, the basic research question, as I said, is how to do very large scale collective problem solving. I want to talk about our experience in doing that with the Climate Collab in terms of three concepts, contests, contest families, and contest webs. So again, the question, how to do large-scale problem solving in the context of online communities. The problem we picked for doing this, for better or for worse, was the simple little problem of what to do about global climate change. Now, I kick myself every other day for picking such a complicated problem. It's got its pluses and minuses as a vehicle for research, but for better or worse, that's the problem we picked. It's a problem that many people would say is one of the most important problems we face as a species today. It's a problem that's affected by all of our actions and that potentially affects every one of us. It's also a problem for which many people would say the solutions and the efforts to solve it that we've attempted so far haven't really worked very well. Uh, in fact, even the recent and I think historic agreement in Paris, which I actually attended the conference for that, uh, even that, while I think it may well be a turning point in our public and societal approach to this problem, is actually not the solution or anywhere close to the solution by itself. The, the agreement has very little that's actually legally binding. And even if all the countries met all the aspirational goals specified there, it still wouldn't be nearly enough to solve the problem. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And those are all reasons, in a sense, for pessimism. There is, however, I think, at least one reason for optimism, which is that we now have a new way of solving really big, hard, complicated problems that wasn't even possible, say, 20 years ago. If you think about things like Wikipedia and the community that created Linux and Google and a lot of the things we're going to talk about over the next two days, these examples show that it's now possible to harness the collective intelligence of thousands of people all over the world working together at a scale and with a degree of collaboration that was never possible before in human history. So our goal in this project is to apply this crowdsourcing approach to the problem of what to do about global climate change. To do that, we've created an online platform called the Climate Collab, and a community of over 50,000 people all over the world who are using this platform. The community includes some of the world's leading experts on the science and policy of climate change, and it also includes business people, students, uh, NGO members, uh, uh, policymakers, people from all walks of life and literally all over the world, as you'll see in a few minutes. Together, these people are developing and evaluating proposals for what to do about different aspects of the problem of global climate change. So I'd like to talk about how they're doing that in the context of these three key things you might call design patterns, contests, contest families, and contest webs. So start with contests. What do I mean by a contest? I mean a situation where anyone in a large group who wants to can create possible solutions to a problem. Now, this is certainly not a novel design pattern. This has been used for centuries, presumably for millennia, 
And even online, there are a number of cases of people doing online contests like Innocentive, Top Coder, and a bunch of others shown here. In our case, the proposals, the entries people make in the contests, are proposals for things they think should be done about some aspect of the climate change problem. These proposals can include suggestions for technical, economic, social, political, any other changes people think should be made. Here's an example of a proposal that was the winner of the grand prize in our contests last year. It's a proposal for something called the Sun Saluter, uh, developed by a young woman named Eden Full. This is an idea for a device that's a rotating solar panel. It rotates over the course of the day to follow the sun across the sky. By doing that, it generates about 20% more electricity than a fixed solar panel. And the thing that powers the rotation of this device is water and gravity. The water drips out and then gravity pulls it across the rota rotational sphere. That water is also filtered to make clean drinking water. So the same device generates both electricity and clean drinking water to critical needs for millions of people in the world. In addition to this technical solution, uh, we have many other proposals for things like how to do levies for maritime shipping uh, that are consistent with international law. We have ideas about aspirational lifestyles for Chinese consumers that are more sustainable. Lots of different ideas about many different kinds of things. In some of the contests, we also have built-in computer simulations that let people estimate the likely impact of the ideas they develop. And these activities are organized mostly through a series of contests. Here's an example of one of our contests on how to put a price on carbon in the United States. Each of the contests includes a set of expert advisors and judges. In this case, as you may see, uh, the advisors include George Shultz, the former Secretary of State, two former members of Congress, one Republican and one Democrat. Uh, one of the judges is also uh, the person who's now just recently become the US Nego climate negotiator, he would go to the equivalent of the Paris Agreement talks next year. Uh, we also have uh, a group of what you might call semi-experts, typically graduate students or other young professionals who help with the day-to-day -day administration of these contests. We've developed a series of phases for these contests, Se semi-finalists, finalists, the judges pick both of those, and then the judges select a judge's choice winner, and popular vote of everyone in the community selects a popular choice winner in each of these contests. By the way, this resulted from uh, one of our lessons in the very first year we did this, where we let anybody create any proposal, and then anybody vote on the proposal they liked best. The winning proposal that year was one called 350 parts per million or bust which was a proposal put in by a graduate student who was just testing the limits of the simulation model. And he said, what's the most we could do? Well, let's see, let's take all emissions down by 99% in the next 10 years. So it looked good, low emissions, everybody liked that, but every expert we talked to said, short of a global holocaust of some kind, there's no way you could actually do that. So now we don't let the public vote on things until the experts have said this is at least a reasonable possibility. It's feasible, plausible, et cetera. So I'm giving you some of the details here just to give you a sense of some of the nitty gritty of what we've learned along the way of doing this. Uh, I think one observation from this first set of things is that the global crowd is able to generate good ideas ideas that experts and lots of others think are interesting and potentially useful. So, next question is, what brings people to this site in the first place? And here I'm gonna start reporting some of the work that Gary has been involved with in terms of doing surveys of our community member members. Uh, here's a list of motivations people say motivated them to be members of the community in decreasing order. They're mostly interested in changing the world learning things, interacting with others, being recognized for their contributions. Winning monetary prizes is actually a very small motivation for them, which in a sense is less of a surprise than it might be since the monetary prizes are available 
are so small. <laughs> um, uh, the people who are interested in making lots of money wouldn't come to our site for that purpose. Uh, we had a $10,000 grand prize across the entire set of contests and another 10,000 distributed in something I'll tell you more about later. Uh, we also give a lot of emphasis to giving people visibility for their good ideas. For instance, some of our winners have presented in briefings at the United Nations and the US Congress. Uh, all of them have had a chance to present at our conferences every year at MIT for the Climate Collab. Uh, there's another thing that also we found leads people to come to the site. Here's a track of site visitors by date. We've had over 400,000 visitors to the site. You notice some spikes in there. Here's also a graph of new members by date. You notice spikes at the same places there. Here's cumulative members by date. We have, as I said, over 50,000 people. Those spikes occur during our voting periods. Those spikes occur during the period when people are able to vote to select the popular choice winners. And if you think about it, it's not hard to guess what's going on. If you're a finalist, you can't do anything about the judges, whether they're going to pick you as the judge's choice winner. But you know that you could be the popular choice winner if enough people vote for you. And anybody who registers on the site is able to vote. So you have a motivation to bring people, anybody you know or can find, get them to come to the site, register, and vote for your proposal. So that appears to be a significant driver of membership at the site. And once people come in in that way, then at least some of them stay and continue active in the future. So this is an observation. In a certain sense, it seems obvious, but I don't know if people who've talked about this before, that online voting appears to be one effective way of increasing membership in an online community. So uh, another set of results from the surveys Gary's, Gary has worked on with us in this project. Uh, the members of the CoLab community have these characteristics. Basically, they are male, surprisingly well-educated. Almost 60% have gone to graduate school, and almost half from outside the US. Uh, they believe global climate change is happening, that it's partly caused by humans, and that it's important to be involved in this in some way. Uh, almost all of our members believe the first two things. Only about two-thirds of the US public believes that. So in general, it's a highly educated international group who believe that climate change is important, doing something about it is important. Not too surprising. Here's something that's a little surprising. Here's a regression showing the likelihood of submitting a proposal based on several demographic characteristics. It turns out that men and people with prior climate-related experience are more likely to submit a proposal. But given that you've submitted a proposal, none of those things are a significant predictor of whether your proposal becomes a finalist. In other words, your winning ideas are just as likely to come from people with no graduate school experience, no prior climate change experience, and from people who are female and from outside the US. In fact, it's slightly more likely, but that's not a significant difference. It's at least as likely uh, to do this. So we think that's pretty interesting. In some sense, it confirms the basic idea that it's good to give lots of people a chance to contribute ideas, because surprising ones may have some of the best ideas. So that's contests in general. Let's now talk about what I call contest families. Uh, here's a list of some of our current contests that are open right now today. This may look like a kind of random list of topics related to climate change, but in fact, they are chosen in a relatively systematic way. And that's how I define a contest family, a group of contests chosen systematically to explore different aspects of a complex problem. For instance, you can choose them to completely cover the space of all possible solutions, or to pick things that are particularly high leverage, or various other ways of choosing these contests. A bunch of other examples of sites that have done what, by this definition, would be called contest families, Innocentive, Topcoder, Crowdforge, et cetera. In our case, we spent a lot of time working with climate change experts and others to come up with a systematic taxonomy of what you might call the problem space of climate change. 
uh, about what humans can do about climate change. And we ended up with four dimensions. What actions are being taken? Where are they being taken? Who is doing them? And how are they doing them? So each of those dimensions can be broken down further. The what dimension, for instance, is broken down into reducing emissions, adapting to changes that occur anyway, and changing the way the world responds to emissions, the, the atmosphere. So that's mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering. The where dimension is based on obvious geography. The who dimension is things like governments, businesses, other organizations. The how dimension is physical, political, economic, and so forth. We also have uh, an outline view of these that shows you this structure and the different contests included in different, each of the different categories. We've also had used this taxonomy to cover the space of possible ideas. So we have one contest for every category in the what dimension. So that's our comprehensive selection of contests. And then we also have other contests for things that are particularly important, we or experts believe, or things that are of particular interest to our partner organizations. Uh, for instance, here's one of the, the kind of coverage contests on energy supply. We also have ones for transportation, buildings, etc. Here's the carbon price you saw already, which was a specifically important one, a key leverage point. Here's the numbers of contests we've had each year over the last few years. I think it's interesting to observe that you see almost the same pattern in the number of proposals we've had each year. So an observation here is that breaking the overall problem down systematically in this way appeared to contribute significantly to the number, quality, and range of the proposals submitted. So now let's talk about the last design pattern, the pattern of contest webs. I define a, well, so let me just show you an example. Uh, we've talked in the contest families about how to break the problem into pieces. We found that's a very important thing to do. But if you think about it, there's something else you need to do. If you've broken a problem into pieces, you need to somehow put those pieces back together into a solution for the whole problem if you're really going to solve the problem. So the way we're doing that is by having a set of what you might call integrated contests, where people compete to come up with plans for what to do at a larger level, a national or a global level, that bring together ideas from all the other contests. In fact, uh, so what I'd, the way I would define contest webs is as collections of contests in which some contests include entries, uh, the entries in some contests include combinations of entries from other contests. I call those integrated contests. It's also important that there, no be, there be no cycles in these patterns. So in a sense, this is uh, a directed acyclic graph. An important special case of that, by the way, is a contest stack where you, each level can only call things in the next level. We don't know of anyone else who's tried to do this. And this seems to us like a promising way of using contests to solve much larger scale problems than you could solve with single point contests one at a time. In the last year's contest for the Climate Collab, we had one global contest. We had six regional or national contests shown there. And then we had about 15 contests in various other areas to cover the space and the special focus on things like changing attitudes and so forth. Here's a picture of the actual relationships between the global, national, and other contests last year, just as we would have hoped. You see a very interestingly complex set of patterns. The top row is the global. All the lines show that the other proposals at other levels that the global proposals included. The middle row is the national and regional proposals, and many of them were included in many of the global proposals, and they also in turn included a lot of the lower level proposals. In some cases also, global proposals reached all the way down to the lower level. So what we have is not strictly a stack, but we think that makes sense in this case. 
So, uh, so that's what we've done. Now let's step back a moment and think a little bit about theory that kind of justifies that and also suggests a way of going a little further. The theory I'm going to talk about here is sort of at the intersection of organization theory and economics. Economists would call it uh, industrial organization. Organization theorists would call it organization design. Basically, and it's based on work by people like Coase and Williamson, uh, one of the questions in designing any kind of system is how to coordinate the dependencies between the different parts. And two important ways of doing that are hierarchies and markets. So we know these very well in the world of business. Hierarchies are big companies where managers make decisions about how to coordinate the different parts of things that report to them. Markets are like supply chains where instead of doing everything inside one company, you outsource it to other companies and then the negotiation between buyers and sellers essentially does the coordinating. Here's an example of a hierarchy. Since we're in Michigan, I thought it might be appropriate to use an example involving automobiles. So if you imagine making Ford cars and GM cars, each of those needs to have engines and wheels and of course other things too, and each of those needs to have parts of various types. Uh, and of course this is an oversimplification, but loosely speaking you could say that there's a manager responsible for each of those things and they're aggregated in something like the way shown here. That's the hierarchical approach to coordinating the manufacture of cars. You can also, and by the way, that's the way it was done more or less for many years. Henry Ford, for instance, was famous for buying rubber plantations in South America so that they'd have a ready source of rubber for the tires for their cars. That's, so that's one way of coordinating the process. Another way of coordinating the process is through markets, through basically outsourcing lots of stuff. So you could imagine that Ford and GM bought engines from other companies and wheels from still other companies and that the people who made those parts in turn bought the subparts from lots of other companies. And in fact, the automobile industry has moved significantly in this direction since the old days uh, and the computer industry is almost completely in this kind of horizontal stack kind of approach. One of the advantages of this approach as opposed to hierarchies is that you have more opportunity for more possible combinations of things to be considered. Think, for example, what happens if this guy, if this is a vice president of engines, and somebody down here has a great idea about how to do steel frames that nobody ever thought of before, it's a wonderful idea. But for some reason, the vice president of engines doesn't like this guy and sort of kills the idea. Then, Nobody else ever knows about it. Nobody else can do anything about it. Whereas if you're in a market, if this guy has a great idea, even if this guy doesn't like it, there are all these other guys or gals who can look at it and combine it in another way. So that's one of the advantages of this market-like way of considering possible innovations. Now, do you see any resemblance between this structure and the one we saw a few minutes ago. I think this is basically equivalent to a supply chain using markets. So what we've done is create a kind of supply chain for intellectual products, which in this case are proposals of how to do different kinds of things. The supply chain results in global plans, but those global plans have subcomponents, which are national plans, which in turn have sub-subcomponents which are more detailed things about what can go on in each country. So, that leads to another question though, which is how do you provide incentives to people to create the right kinds of plans that fit together in the right ways? And here I want to appeal to a different kind of theory which is essentially information economics. With physical products, there's a very well-known and relatively straightforward solution to setting prices for things. Since each physical product, each piece of rubber or each piece of steel can only be used in one car, 
you can just let the buyers and sellers negotiate with each other. And when they agree on a price, that's the price it is. And if they don't agree, then it doesn't get transferred. So there's lots of theory about how this works. And under a lot of reasonable assumptions, this leads to a very efficient allocation of resources. That's for physical products that can only be used once. For information products, once you've created them, there's generally almost no cost in using them any number of times. So that's a different thing than physical products. And if you just let buyers and sellers negotiate the way they do with physical products, there might well be cases where the creator of something, for any kind of reason, doesn't want to price it in a reasonable way, and therefore something that societal resources were invested in creating doesn't get used in nearly the number of places it could actually be useful. So what, what uh, some economists have talked about is another way of dealing with information products, which is, a, is what you might call compulsory licensing. People have talked about this with patents, for instance, that perhaps patents should be com com involve compulsory licensing, that once you've created the patent, anyone should be able to use it. In fact, something like this does actually work with uh, music for public broadcasting, music and art, I believe, where uh, anybody can use it once it's created, and then you have to compensate the creator in some fair way that will motivate people to create more things. So in the Climate Collab, we're experimenting with a variation of that second approach. Since the products here are information products, proposals, we're experimenting with an approach that says, once you've created something, you have to let anyone else use it. But then you get compensated in a, quote, fair way. So what does that mean in terms of the, the kinds of characteristics or properties that you'd like to be true for the compensation? Well, you'd like them to provide incentives for people to spend time on the parts of the problem that are important to the overall solution. You don't want them to provide strong incentives for gaming the system in some way, because that could lead to a lot of bad outcomes. You want them to be simple enough to administer and understand. And you want them to seem fair to the people who participate. In fact, Marshall Van Alstein has shown, has proved some theorems that show that even if they're not exactly optimal, as long as the participants believe that the incentives, incentives are fair, then they will exert more or less optimal efforts to do the things that need to be done. So in the Climate Collab, we've created something we call Collab Points that we believe have these properties. That is, integrated proposal authors can use any combination of lower level proposals without any agreement from the lower level authors. And then the end customers, which in our case are the judges for the global proposals, they decide which global proposals they want to buy. I'm using that in quotes, of course. And they give points to those winning proposals. So that's like the buyers of the final integrated product, the fi final automobile, say. Then those points, uh, and they give them in proportion this year. They did it in this way, adding up to 10,000 points, but various uh, proportional allocation across the first through fifth place prizes. Then those points are allocated among all the people who contributed to all the proposals that were included at any level in the winning global proposals. So each proposal team divides their points however they want among themselves. That's essentially like dividing equity in a startup company. Then the points that come to any proposal, some of them go to the proposal authors, divided in the way I just said. The rest get distributed to the sub-proposals that that proposal contains. And that distribution to sub-proposals, we try to do roughly in proportion to the amount of work needed to create the different proposals and to how important the proposals are to the overall solution. This year, we used the, this kind of algorithm for doing that. We don't 
claim this is optimal. It seems to be reasonable, but I think some interesting questions are, are there better algorithms for allocating those points? In this case, the global proposal winners kept 5% and 95% was distributed to the lower levels because most of the work was done there. At the regional level, they kept 9% and distributed 90% to the lower levels. We didn't expect this. We didn't think about this. But it turned out that when we did all this, here's the distribution of points people received. A few people got a whole lot of points. A whole lot of people got very few points in between. It was a power law. Just the same kind of distribution you see for sizes of cities and strengths of earthquakes and all kinds of phenomena in the natural and social worlds. So uh, we haven't figured out an exact theory to explain why it should be this, but it seems to be a pretty interesting result that this is what it is. So conceptual observations for this last part. The, uh, one of the virtues of this collab points system is that it motivates the authors of integrated proposals to help other proposal writers create good proposals that fit well in the integrated proposals. It also motivates the integrated proposal writers to create lower level proposals themselves if they don't see what they need already there. That's from the top down. From the bottom up, it motivates the lower level proposal authors to create good proposals that higher level proposal authors will want to use and to be sure that those higher level authors know about the good proposals they've created. Exactly the kinds of motivations you would want for this to work. In a sense, just as in supply chains for other kinds of products, what this does is lead people to compete with each other in a single contest, but to collaborate with each other across levels. So we think that is a very desirable property. And in conclusion, I think that this work shows how new information technologies allow some pretty surprising new approaches to organizational design. And I think more specifically, this suggests how online communities can be designed in ways that may help us solve some of our most important societal and other problems far more effectively than would otherwise have been possible. <laughs>